thank you. So um, I want to talk a little bit this evening about um, Ada Lovelace herself, um, why she's important, uh, a bit about the work that we do with Ada Lovelace. And, and I, ha I actually decided not to focus too much on women in technology because there is this absolutely awesome booklet on your seats which you have to take home and read. And I thought I didn't want to preempt the fantastic stuff that's in there. Um, so um, I'm... Uh, I used to work in, in technology. Um, I was a web designer for, um, for many years in the late 90s and, and early noughties, and then started working in, in social technology. And um, I decided uh, in so 2000, late 2008 um, to look at the issue of, of women in technology, because as a woman in tech, uh, it was slightly frustrating for me to see... Um, go to conferences and see that there just weren't very many women on stage. Um, and be really, between sort of 2006 and 2008, there was a lot of conversations on the internet, on blogs, uh, about where are the women in, in tech? You know, uh, we'd see these conference listings with no women. We'd ask the organisers, you know, why are there no women in tech? And they would come up with, there were three common answers. The first one was, um, we asked all the women and they all said no. Um, we couldn't find any women, and there aren't any women, which was always frustrating because I thought, well, I'm, I'm in tech, I'm a woman, I have so, lots of friends who are women. Um, so we started to kind of challenge each other and say, right, name five people you think ought to be on stage. And it became apparent that even we struggled. We could name five women that were our friends, but it was difficult to name five women who were luminaries, who were you know, really uh, high in the industry. And it wasn't that they didn't exist, it was just that we didn't know about them. And it was examples like um, Marissa Mayer. Now, Marissa Mayer was Google's first female engineer, one of their first 20 employees. And yet, when we suggested her as a woman in tech, we would hear, well, she's not really a techie. I mean, you know, she, there's no coding in her current role. Now, she has um, a bachelor's in symbolic systems and a master's in computer science from Stanford. Um, her specialism was artificial intelligence. If Marissa Mayer isn't a techie, then um, I honestly don't know who qualifies because she is absurdly qualified as a techie. Um, and it was around this time that I discovered some work by a psychologist called Penelope Lockwood who found that women need female role models more than men need male role models. And if I can quote from her directly, she said, outstanding women can function as inspirational examples of success, illustrating the kinds of achievements that are possible for the women around them. They demonstrate that it is possible to overcome traditional gender barriers, indicating to other women that high levels of success are indeed attainable. So what we need is to create role models. And I thought, role models we can do. Actually, role models are quite simple because all we need to do to create a new role model is tell someone's story, talk about the work that they've done, talk about their achievements, and that felt like something that we could do. Um, now, I needed a name because I thought International Day of blogging about women in technology wasn't really that snappy. Um, and a friend of mine suggested Ada Lovelace Day. And I thought, who is Ada Lovelace? I have no idea. I'd never heard of her. So um, I looked her up on the internet and found out she was the first person to publish a computer program and the first person to recognise uh, the importance of the general purpose computer. Her achievements, particularly back in 2009, were very much overlooked. There were not very many people who recognised her work. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about her. So I'm going to give you kind of like the... the the deep dive into Ada Lovelace. And to understand Ada, you sort of kind of have to really understand her parents. She was born Augusta Ada Byron, daughter of the romantic poet George Gordon, Lord Byron, and Anne Isabella Milbank, the Baroness Wentworth, who was known to her friends and family as Annabella. Byron, of course, hugely famous, a shot to fame, probably the first superstar the first celebrity in 1812 with a poem called Child Harold's Pilgrimage. Uh, it was about a young nobleman, um, and 
it's, it's, about, it's the first example of the Byronic hero, uh, an intelligent, well-educated, charismatic man pr prone to mood swings, so basically Byron. Um, he was a difficult man uh, of difficult parents. Byron's father was called Captain John Mad Jack Byron, uh, and his mother was the heiress Catherine Gordon, uh, whose wealth Mad Jack squandered. Um, Byron was very self-conscious um, and very, uh, very open to relationships with anybody. Very scandalous. There were an awful lot of romantic scandals around Byron. Annabella was very intelligent, um, very much like Byron in that respect. Uh, educated by former Cambridge University professors, which was unusual for the time studied literature, philosophy, science, and maths, and she loved maths. And Byron called her his princess of parallelograms. She met Byron when she was just 19 and he was 24, and she told her parents and her friends she had no interest in him whatsoever. She saw everybody fawning over him, how famous he was, and didn't want any part of it. Um, but as Byron played the, the kind of no one loves me, everybody hates me card, Annabella became very sympathetic to him and eventually fell in love. And uh, her biographer, Julia Marcus, puts it that she became the very good girl determined to save the very bad man. Um, they got married uh, January 1815 at a private ceremony at her parents' home. Uh, and Byron was several days late to his own wedding. Not an auspicious start. Um, the marriage didn't last very long at all. It only really lasted a year. Uh, in 1815, December 1815, Annabella gave birth to Ada. And then one month later, she took Ada and fled to her parents. Byron um, publicly said that he was heartbroken father. Um, and he said some, some very mean things about Annabella, called her cold and prudish. Um, but actually, Annabella was an amazing woman in her own right, and um, I do recommend the, the biography of her. She was described as one of the most excellent beings in the world by the author Anna Jameson. Uh, she was socially progressive, founded a school for infants that was based on ideas of, of play and kindness and cheerfulness, which for the Victorian era was in, deeply unusual. Um, as a child, um, Annabella, were, uh, Annabella was very worried about Ada growing up. Um, Ada herself became captivated by machines. She spent a long time looking at uh, new inventions and looking at diagrams and reading uh, periodicals. By the age of 12, Ada had invented a steam-powered flying machine. He, she actually studied the way that birds flew so that she could understand how to design the wings for her flying machine. And Annabella had Ada schooled in maths and science, primarily because she really wanted to make sure that Ada didn't inherit her father's poetic tendencies. And one of Ada's uh, teachers was this man, Augustus de Morgan. He was a mathematician and a logician. And he was very impressed by Ada. Had Ada been a man, he said, she would have had the potential to become an original ma uh, mathematical investigator, perhaps of first-rate eminence. But this was an era where physical health and mental health were thought to be one and the same. Your physical strength and your mental strength were the same. And Ada had been a very sickly child. She'd had headaches that had obscured her vision. Maybe they were migraines. Uh, she was paralyzed by measles and confined to bed for a year. And de Morgan worried that the very great tension of mind which they, the maths problems, require is beyond the strength of a woman's physical power of application. It was recommended that Ada give up her maths, but she did not. In 1835, age 19, Ada married William King, the eighth Baron King, and she became Baroness King. And they had three children together, Byron, Anne Isabella, and Ralph Gordon. Now, unusually for the time, uh, 
King allowed Ada to continue her studies, even encouraged her. This was something that was quite unusual. If you had interests before you got married, once you got married, your primary focus should be your family. Um, but he was very tolerant of, of her activities. Um, when he became the, Earl of, the first Earl of Lovelace, Ada became the Right Honourable, the Countess of Lovelace. In correspondence, she signed herself uh, Augusta Ada Lovelace, or AAL, and today we just call her Ada Lovelace. Now, one of her most important friends and teachers was Mary Somerville, and Somerville was a mathematician and an astronomer, and she kind of became famous in her own right. She translated the five-volume Mécanique Céleste by Pierre-Simon Laplace for the beautifully named Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. And when it was published in 1831, she became famous. Uh, translation was seen as an appropriate pastime for a woman, and her book, The Mechanism of the Heavens, um, is actually really dense with mathematics. She must have known a lot of maths in order to even begin the translation. So it wasn't actually just a straight translation work. In 1833, Mary Somerville introduced Ada Lovelace to Charles Babbage, mathematician, inventor, mechanical engineer, and very keen campaigner against street music. Uh, one time, Babbage got so enraged by musicians on the street that he went outside without his hat. This caused a huge scandal. Um, but Babbage was working on a machine called the Difference Engine. This was a machine for calculating large tables of numbers, so uh, log tables, trig tables. These calculations were normally done by hand, by people, and they were very prone to error. But if you're using a number from one of these tables in your calculations, then if that number's wrong, your calculations are wrong. And you will never know because you can't tell from looking at it if the number's wrong. In fact, it's said that some ships wrecked off of Cornwall because of mistakes in their navigation tables. So this was a serious problem. This wasn't just uh, being a stickler for detail. This, this had life and death uh, ramifications. So the British government gave Babbage £17,000 to work on his difference engine. That's about £1.7 million in today's money, roughly speaking. But there was a problem with the engineer in charge of the project, and Babbage had to basically give up on it. He never produced the difference engine for the British government. But he had had a better idea, and this idea was the analytical engine. This was a general-purpose computing machine. It used loops of punched cards to control it, like a jacquard loom, and it could be programmed via those cards to do quite complex, complex computations. So when you look at the computers in this museum, this had a lot of the same sorts of uh, uh, components in terms of it had an arithmetical unit for doing maths, it had conditional branching and loops. It had memory. And Babbage even designed a printer for it. And it would all be driven by steam. It was a much more important machine than the difference engine. But like the difference engine, it was never actually built. In fact, he never properly finished the design for it. The most complete design is number 28. Uh, and even that is proving very difficult for modern mathematicians and historians to interpret. But Lovelace, Lovelace understood it. She was fascinated by this analytical engine, and she became an expert. And it was a bit of a mutual appreciation club. It is said that Babbage himself spoke highly of her mathematical powers and of her peculiar capability, higher, he said, than of anyone he knew to prepare the descriptions connected with his calculating machine. So Babbage joked to Michael Faraday, uh, that Lovelace was the enchanted maths fairy. He said she was that enchantress who has thrown her magical spell around the most abstract of sciences and has grasped it with the force which few masculine intellects could have exerted over it. Now, in 1842, um, Babbage... Oh, it's going to play up, isn't it? Babbage gave a lecture in 1842... Um, 
about the analytical engine at the University of Turin. And that man that you saw fleetingly rush past um, is Luigi Manabria, who is an Italian mathematician. And Manabria took notes during Babbage's lecture, and he wrote up a paper which was published, which explained the analytical engine. And uh, Lovelace was uh, uh, asked, it was suggested to Lovelace, um, possibly by Charles Wheatstone, that she translate it. Because again, translation was seen as, as something that, that women were good at. Um, she spoke fluent French. So uh, Manabria, who was Italian, wrote the paper and published it in French. And she translated it from French into English. And the thing is that Lovelace really understood that the analytical engine was so far ahead of the difference engine. And as she was translating this paper and she was organizing her thoughts, she made a major conceptual leap that no one else at the time did. No one else understood this. She realized that if this machine could manipulate numbers, it could manipulate symbols. Those symbols could stand for anything. Now, symbolic logic underpins all modern um, computer programming. But at that point, it was um, an emerging field. And it was Lovelace's friend and uh, teacher, Augustus de Morgan, who was uh, very much at the forefront of symbolic logic. Now, Lovelace was keen when she was translating. She added her own notes. And her notes to the paper actually tripled its length. So they were fairly substantial. And she wanted to distinguish between the analytical engine and the difference engine. Um, the analytical engine does not occupy mere common ground, common ground with mere calculating machines. And I have a very long uh, quote from her, because one of the things that Lovelace wasn't good at was um, short sentences. In enabling mechanism to combine together general symbols, in successions of unlimited variety and extent, a uniting link is established between the, operation, the operations of matter and the abstract mental processes of the most abstract branch of mathematical science. A new, a vast, and powerful language is developed for the future use of analysis. And by analysis, she actually means mathematics. So what she's saying here is that if we can use symbols and we can control our programming with symbols, we can essentially do any maths we like. So in the notes that she wrote to the translation, she outlined several early computer programs, but the most important one is in note G, and this is a program to calculate Bernoulli numbers. Now, it doesn't really matter what Bernoulli numbers are. Um, they're complicated, complicated numerical system. Um, it just matters that it was complicated, um, but she really could have chosen anything. And what Ada did was she described how to break down the algebra into simple formulae that could be calculated using very basic maths. This is maths anyone in this room can do. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. That was how basic it was. So she created these instructions and worked out how to encode it onto the punched cards that would then control the analytical engine. So what we have here is um, these are the, the variable numbers, and then you can't really see it very clearly, but in this second column here, that's the, um, whether it's division, multiplication, addition, or subtraction. So I can probably just see there, that's a plus, that's a division, that's a division. Um, and so this is step by step how to calculate Bernoulli numbers. So there were earlier programs, sketches of programs by Babbage, but Ada's was the most elaborate, it was the most complete, and it was the first one that was published. Now, Ada Lovelace's culture, remember, hadn't developed a concept of a machine much beyond an automaton. So this is a clockwork doll, basically, that mimics life. So here we have um, three automata from a guy called Pierre Jacquet Droz, who was absolute mastermind. He was the best of the best. Um, so this is the musician, the draftsman, and the writer. And when they're turned on, there's clockwork in the back. And that clockwork controls the movement of the doll so that it looks as if it is uh, alive. But in fact, the automator can't actually do anything it's not programmed to. It, it can only do one set of movements. Now, Lovelace almost certainly saw The Silver Lady, which was um, 
uh, automaton that could bow and put up her eyeglass at intervals as if to passing acquaintances, because that Babbage owned the Silver Lady. Now, the difference was between these, these clockwork dolls and the analytical engine was that the analytical engine could work out an answer for itself without being told what that answer was. And she knew that this was groundbreaking. Lovelace realised how important this was. So when she says here, you know, I want to put something in about the Newley's numbers, uh, so the function may be worked out by the engine without having been worked out by human head and hands first. That was really important. No one else saw how important that really was. It meant that the analytic engine could do more than calculate big tables of numbers, could maybe make art. The analytical engine, she said, weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. Not only would it be capable of composing art, it would be capable of composing music given the right instructions. Supposing, she said, that the fundamental relations of pitched sound in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So what she's saying is if we can work out the rules of harmony and rhythm and sound, this machine can compose original music by itself. That was an amazing leap. I mean, she was conceptualizing computers as we know them now, 150 years ago. It's just astonishing. But she did have a challenge. She really struggled to explain this to the British government. Um, the British government wasn't very happy with Babbage. He'd had vast sum of money from them and not produced the difference engine. They did not want to fund his new machine. But even other people struggled to understand what Lovelace understood. And I think it's true to say it was 100 years before anybody recognised the importance of her work. And that person was Alan Turing, father of modern computer science. When he started working on the first modern computers in the 40s, he found Lovelace's work and he recognised the importance of it. He wrote a, a paper called Computer, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, and he asks the question, can machines think? He listed contrary views, as he called them, um, and he talks about Lady Lovelace's objection. So Lovelace had said, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can only do whatever we know how to order it to perform. So what she's saying is it can't create its own programs. We have to program it. And Gray Turing uh, points out that, you know, Lovelace didn't have any evidence to allow her to presume differently. But she was working 100 years before him. And remember, Babbage never built the analytical engine. So she did everything without a working computer. So she couldn't test anything. She couldn't iterate. She couldn't go back and fix mistakes. She had to look at everything from first principles and work it out in her head and try and spot any mistakes just by reading through what she'd written. Now, there is some controversy about Lovelace's contributions. Um, luckily, I don't get quite so many tweets now saying, ah, but. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the issues that, that do get brought up, because um, I think it's important to understand. Um, one of the questions is, did Lovelace actually understand calculus? And it is true that in one of her letters, she wrote, these functional equations are complete will-o'-the-wisps to me. And she found calculus quite frustrating. But calculus was quite frustrating for quite a lot of people. Uh, this person is Charles Dodgson, known as Lewis Carroll. And he studied maths for four years at Oxford, came top of his class, went on to lecture max maths at Oxford, and he said, talked over the calculus of variations with Price today. I see no prospect of understanding the subject at all. So Lovelace was in good company struggling with calculus. Um, and in fact, modern mathematicians have looked at some of her work and, and, and some of them believe that she was actually working at the forefront of calculus. Um, so I think it's unfair to criticise Ada for struggling with it. She conquered it. She carried on. She was, uh, she was a very well, um, very stubborn person. 
Um, but another accusation is that she didn't write the Bernoulli programme. I think the confusion comes from Babbage's biography, uh, in which he basically says that, you know, she, uh, she chose the um, Bernoulli programme and she did everything except the algebraic working out, so except the maths, uh, which I had offered to do to save Lady Lovelace the trouble. So what's notable here is two things. Firstly, that he didn't do it because she couldn't. He did it to save her some time. And also, what does he mean by algebraic workings out? He means the maths. He doesn't actually mean the program. Because the program itself was that big table that I showed you. It's not actually the maths. Um, so even though he did that, Lovelace worked on, on the programme, and obviously they collaborated. Letters, the post, this is amazing, the post went several times a day, sometimes six times a day. And if you missed the post, you would send your personal messenger. Um, so they would send these letters back and forth, some of them very, very short, almost like email. Um, there's one from Babbage, and all it says is, return sheet with two corrections, write about card requiring new variable. And that's it. Um, they met, uh, they discussed her draft, they discussed the work. Um, she often asked him for plans, and, and he would reply with uh, statements like, um, I'm not sure, I'll see what I can do, uh, or paraphrasing um, him, of course. But she had written this programme, and she sent it to him in a letter. Uh, and not only was she the first computer programmer, but she was to become the first computer programmer to wish she'd taken a backup, because Babbage lost her letter. And when he said to her, I, I, I have lost it, either me, the printer, the printer probably lost it, and she replied to him, I suppose I must set to work to write something better, if I can, as a substitute. The same precisely I could not recall. I think I should be able in a couple of days to do something. However, I should be deucedly inclined to swear at you, I will allow. Once Babbage had the new version, he replied, I like very much the improved form of the Bernoulli note, but can judge of it better when I have the diagram and notation. To me, that reads like he needs her to finish up her notation in order for him to understand it. If he'd written it, that would not be a question. That would not be a problem. He would understand it because he'd written it. So I don't think he can possibly have written the Bernoulli program. Now, Lovelace continued working on the program, sometimes working 18 hours a day. She really was dedicated. Uh, in 1843, uh, her program was published, her, the translation and all of her notes. Um, and Menabria, Luigi Menabria, the Italian mathemat mathematician, asked Babbage to pass on his congratulations. And Michael Faraday told Babbage that it was all completely over his head. We won't ever exactly know who wrote what, which line came from who, but I don't think that matters. They were a team, but Lovelace contributed a huge amount to to the paper and, and also her vision was something that after her death, Babbage never really, uh, never repeated. He, he didn't draw on her vision, I think, because um, he didn't quite internalize it the way that maybe Lovelace had. So it's hard to know uh, how she would have fulfilled her potential. Um, we know she had an interest in electricity. Uh, we know she bought a kaleidoscope before she died. Um, but she died in 1852. She was only 36, same age as her father. Uh, and that was less than 10 years after her paper was published. So things have changed quite a bit since Lovelace's time, I'm, I'm very happy to say. Uh, but we still have a challenge. We still face gendered expectations of what girls should do and what boys should do. And I think sometimes I... The world is more divided by gender now than ever used to be. We have gendered books, uh, and here we'll notice that boys get uh, spaceships and dinosaurs, and girls get hearts and aprons uh, and handbags. Um, gendered toys, I think we've all been in, in toy shops where it's just kind of like a no-go zone for um, whichever gender you're not. Um, stereotyping that goes beyond the use of pink and blue, 
So um, this infuriated me because here we have a Lego friend set, nice house, and the woman is in the kitchen with uh, a, a food mixer and the man is sitting watching TV. Um, and not, not ideal. Um, <laughs> gendered balloons. I didn't know that um, there were girl balloons and boy balloons. It makes no sense at all, does it? It's ridiculous. Um, and this one that makes me slightly cross as well, because this is the early learning centre. So they are supposed to be encouraging young children to expand their worldview and learn about science, and girls get the handbag and boys get the doctor. So that's, um, that's always a challenge. Uh, all of them are within, within the last two or three years. Um, so, yes, it is quite frustrating. But we can make a difference. We can do something about this. So, Ada Lovelace Day um, is a worldwide celebration of women in STEM. And, and I, this is this year's map. We're still getting events coming in. They come in until the last minute. I'm really excited. We have an Ada Lovelace Day event in Iceland, which is brilliant. Um, and it, it is fantastic. We, one year, we had one in Antarctica. I'm so pleased about that. Um, so people organise their own events just like this one and, um, and it's, it's, it's brilliant what people do. Uh, we have a podcast um, where I talk to women about their work and I've started doing a sort of invention of the month thing which has been really fascinating to find out what women have done. I'll come on to some of those later. Free crochet patterns. Oh. This is also not going to behave, is it? Free crochet patterns that you'll have to... There we go. Um, so, <laughs> quick, very quick. It's to, it's to keep you excited in, in, in the dark as to what they are. Um, so, basically, uh, when you look at girls' toys, dolls, they're, they're very rarely do you find any dolls that are specifically about women in STEM that teach girls about what women have done and, and the achievements that women have made. I mean, there are some... Mm, dolls sort of independently made, um, but I'm, I love crafting, I love science, I love technology, I also love crochet and I'm just learning to knit, so I mean these things are not mutually exclusive. So the, the idea is that we have uh, free patterns that you can download and you can make your own, um, at the moment we have uh, Dr. Mae Jemison, who um, was an, an astronaut, she went into space. Uh, and is generally amazing, uh, Dr. Eugenie Clark, who was called the Shark Lady. And Eugenie was amazing. She uh, was the person who introduced scuba diving to marine biology. She dived with sharks, learnt about um, how sharks behave, um, how they reproduce. And she was working and diving and researching all the way through up until she died. She was 93 and she was still diving. She was absolutely amazing. And then there's Dr. Anandabai Joshi. And she was the first Indian woman to become a medical doctor, possibly also the first Indian woman to leave India and, and come to America for an education. Actually, possibly the first Indian woman to set foot in America. Absolutely amazing woman. Um, sadly uh, got home to India after getting her medical degree and promptly died of tuberculosis, um, which is tragic. But when you look at some of the very early women in STEM, that's actually uh, a recurring theme because life was much harder then. Um, we also have two books. These are anthologies of um, uh, biographies of women in STEM. So you can read about Eugenie Clark in there and Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper and all sorts of other fantastic people. Um, we have a free education pack as well for teachers that we can download. This is our 10 types of scientists. People often think that if you're a scientist, you wear a white coat and you sit in a lab and you look down a microscope and that's your job. And that's not actually the fact. There are so many different types of scientists um, from explorers and investigators and policy makers. Um, and so this is based on research from the Science Council. And then we have our wonderfully ridiculous careers poster, um, which is that it's so small you can barely read. Uh, and this is essentially your, your A-level subjects, your degree subjects, and this is all of the things that graduates go on to do when they graduate. And this is only 350 
lines of data only. There's actually a lot more opportunity and a lot more careers that you can do with a, a STEM um, degree that we couldn't fit because it was full. Um, so those are free to download, and we've also got some other teaching um, uh, resources as well. Uh, so this is actually some other posters that we've done. One about Ada Lovelace, one about Mary Anning. Mary Anning was this amazing paleontologist. You know about Mary Anning? Fantastic, excellent, I don't need to describe. She was awesome. She also was the person who figured out um, that these things called bezoa stones, they, no one knew what they were. They were an odd kind of fossilized thing. And she worked out that they were fossilized poo. So um, we have our, our podcast. I've mentioned that already. And we have a resources database that we're continually growing. That also includes educational materials as well for any teachers in the room. So this is our, our big and exciting thing that we are launching. You are the first, literally, you are the first people to see this. Because I only, I only got this link about two hours ago. We are launching a recruitment fair for women in STEM in the UK. Um, we've got 16 universities signed up already. Um, and we're going to launch this properly on Ada Lovelace Day on Tuesday. And the idea is, what, one of the things we know is that when women graduate, uh, they are more likely to get a job than men, but they are more likely to get a low-quality job. So men are essentially graduating from university, going home, living with their parents, waiting for the right job to come along, whereas women are taking whatever they can get. Um, so we want to find awesome companies that value diversity and value women and bring them together with women, not just graduates, but uh, doctoral students, early career returners, uh, and really try and revitalize the, um, the careers advice provision and also the, the opportunity for people to find awesome jobs. So, um, so this is very exciting, and, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how this all works out. So one of the important things that we can do, and one of the things I absolutely love about what the, um, the, the centre here has done, is tell the stories of women in STEM. If you haven't already looked at the booklet, please do. It's brilliant. Um, and I want to tell kind of three stories just to, to finish up. The first one is Yvonne Brill. Now, in the 1940s, when the space race was in its infancy, she was quite possibly the only woman working in research in America in the space race. By 1966, she was working for the Radio Corporation of America, and she was working on a communication satellite project, and she was the only woman on the team. Um, she was one of five women engineers at RCA in total, um, and she was the only propulsion engineer they had on this particular project. She was completely responsible for the propulsion project. And they had a bit of an issue with satellite propulsion in that they had two systems, uh, one for large-scale movement, so for getting the satellite into the correct orbit. And then you need to adjust it and make sure that it stays where it needs to be. And they had a, a different system for that. She realized that there's a chemical called hydrazine that um, breaks down in the presence of a catalyst and it, it, the gas expands and that creates thrust. She realized that if you heat the hydrazine, you get a lot more thrust. And she invented a system that used these two processes, the catalytic process and the heated catalytic process, to produce different sort of scales of thrust. So big thrusters for getting it into orbit, small thrusters for maneuvering it. Um, because it used one fuel, it saved weight, which meant either more payload or longer missions. So by 1967, um, she was finalizing the work on this, and RCA asked her to write up uh, her invention for a patent. Um, she finally got the patent in 1974, but it would be nearly 10 years before she saw her system actually in use. Um, satellite uh, uh, customers just one interested in taking a risk, and eventually they did um, a test in 1984, which was successful. And her system, the hydrazine resistor jet, which is also called the electrothermal hydrazine thruster, is basically now industry standard. And there is research for the next phase of, of um, 
propulsion systems, but her work was absolutely integral to satellites that we know. And of course, we're all using that invention every time we use a satellite. Every time you watch satellite TV, you're benefiting from her invention. Uh, this is Betty Nesmith Graham. Um, this is a really sort of of its time invention. I don't know how many of you have typewriters. I've got about five. They're fantastic. They're almost as good as all the computers in the other room. Um, when manual typewriters were sort of invented in the late 1800s and through the sort of 1900s, they were becoming standardized. So you had a, a, an ink tape. And if you made a mistake, if you had a, a, a pencil eraser, you can actually kind of just about get enough of the ink off to, to go back and, and try again. But when the elec electric typewriter came in, they came with a carbon film instead of ink on fabric. Uh, and if you try to rub that out with an eraser, it makes a terrible mess. And so Betty was um, uh, a secretary. She was not a very good typist. And she kept making mistakes. And she had a moment of inspiration where she thought, oh, you know, painters don't erase their mistakes. They paint over them. And so she got a little bottle and made up some white tempura paint and took it with a little watercolor brush into work and sat there. Just paint it out, carry on. And her bosses weren't very keen on this, but her colleagues loved it. And for five years, she was making up little batches for her colleagues. And then eventually someone was like, can you not just sell this? And so she started working evenings and weekends. She carried on her job, she's working evenings and weekends, selling little bottles of what she called liquid paper. She carried on the job for as long as she could. In fact, the only reason she stopped working full time was because she got fired for accidentally writing the name of her own company in an important piece of her employer's correspondence. Um, that was the push that she needed to go full time on her own business. And so by 1970, so she started, she did this invention in 1951. Uh, 1956, she starts selling it. By 1970, she had sold 5 million bottles of liquid paper. By 1975, she had expanded her factory. And she was a real kind of, uh, she really cared about her employees. So she made sure there was, uh, there was a library, there was childcare facilities. And by 1979, they were employing 200 people and shipping 25 million bottles of liquid paper per year. You can still actually get the uh, liquid. It's still a brand. You can still get it um, because there are probably just enough people with typewriters to make it worth it. Um, but she was absolutely amazing. Um, and then the, the third person I want to talk about, Dr. Betty Harris. This is a whole, this is a chemistry. Chemistry and explosives, and, and I personally do love things that go bang. I think that's an important part of science. Um, there is an explosive called TATB, triamino trinitrobenzene. It's more powerful than TNT, but it's very safe. It's very stable. So you can drop it. You can, uh, you can set fire to it. Uh, you can pretty much do anything to TATB and it won't accidentally explode. It won't even explode if it's on a plane and the plane crashes. So it's very widely used, but the problem is you can't detect it. It was very hard to, to identify. So in Los Alamos, which is one of these big sort of government uh, labs in America, they had kind of contamination where experiments had you know, explosive experiments and they didn't know what was in the ground. They needed to find out. So in the 1980s, uh, Dr. Betty Harris uh, worked on a test for discovering TATB. So what she did was she washed the sample with a solvent like uh, acetone, and that removes all the contaminants like TNT. And then she found a reagent that was stable enough in the field that you could use it. And in the presence of TATB, it turned sort of an orangey red. It's a very noticeable color. And the test was simple. It was uh, sensitive, so it can detect very small amounts of TATB, and it's specific, so it only reacts to TATB. Uh, so she got a patent for that in 1986, and now when you go to the airport and you see someone, they have a little wand with a swab on the end when they're checking for explosives, they are using Betty Harris's test to do a spot check to see if you have any remnants of TATB 
on your person or your belongings. So she is also amazing and also uh, she had a fantastic um, anecdote, if I can remember it, about uh, what inspired her was some science uh, projects that she was set at school. And um, uh, one of them was uh, to uh, make an explosive, small explosion, and the other one was to grow yeast. Uh, her small explosion did not work. She did not get a good grade for that. Uh, but she did end up with an explosion because she forgot to take the top off the yeast jar. And as the gas built up, as the fermentation uh, ran away with itself, uh, the jar exploded. So um, she, she liked her explosions. So um, we are all over the internet. Um, so we have our Twitter and Facebook, and we have a website. So if you do want to keep in touch, uh, you can. Um, and my aim is that you know together we create awesome new role models uh, for women in STEM. So quick thank to our thank you to our sponsors who are all fabulous, and thank you very much for listening and being a brilliant audience. Thank you. Yes. Yes. If you go at the top, there's resources and then uh, schools, and then there's lots of links there. And you can download the posters completely for free. Um, but if you want nice, big, shiny printed versions, then we have a shop as well where you can buy them. So, but they're all available for free, all the posters, the um, Ada Lovelace and uh, Mary Anning. And hopefully next year I'll have time to do some more. Because I, 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 would, I would love to do um, Susan LaFleche Picot, who was the first Native American woman to become a doctor. Yes? Thank you. Yes, so um, we have um, in the books that I uh, mentioned, um, I wrote her biography, um, and that's available on our website, and you can read that, and that's up for free. Um, and it's, uh, it, her story is very interesting. Um, and I think as well we've got Mary Anning. She's definitely in one of the books. Mary Anning, also very cool. So. When I first started to study science, I Sometimes I, I was asked these questions, how many women do you know that have received Nobel Prizes or are in, in technology big awards? So what you just said is something that we are not aware of, possibly because we don't do research. But what I believe is now we need our own awards. Yes. So we can say, OK, we, we don't mm. have the Nobel Prize, but we yeah. have other prizes. I would, I would really love to do a, 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 a Lovelace suite of prizes. Um, I think, you know, the Nobel is a particular problem because there have been a lot of women who should have had Nobels that did not. Um, and uh, Chen Xiong Wu being a very good example. She was a physicist. Um, she uh, went to America to do her uh, doctorate and World War II happened. And she had no contact at all with her family in China for eight years she, in until, because it wasn't just during the war, after the war as well. Um, and she worked on a problem. Uh, there was a law at the time in physics called the conservation of parity. And it's a bit complicated, and I'm not sure I can really explain it. Um, but it was thought to be kind of, this is a law, this is how it is. And she uh, put together an experiment to test this law and found that it wasn't true that parity isn't conserved. Um, two of the scientists, the male scientists working on that problem with her, got the Nobel. She, who actually designed the ex and ran the experiment that proved it, did not. Um, and it's the same issue with um, Jocelyn Ben Burnell, uh, who discovered pulsars. And um, she didn't get the Nobel Prize for that either, even though she was the one that um, discovered them. She, she had all this data coming in from a radio telescope, and she kept seeing these little blips. Oh, yeah, Rosalind Franklin. Uh, without her photograph, Crick and Watson. 
The list is unfortunately far too long. Um, but I think you know there are very um, there are lots of industry specific awards. So you have things like the um, you know Young Women Engineer of the Year Award and um, and stuff like that. But it's about you know we need to be able we need to have something of the stature of the Nobel Prize because with that comes the um, the status and you know and, and the media attention and, and because the media need to be telling women's stories but they won't unless there's a a reason to do so and and I think the, the media is is a part of the problem because they look for they look for stories in places that they find familiar and because there's a lot of men in senior positions deciding which stories get covered they cover other men and this is particularly true in technology um, so I agree with you I, we do I don't know how we get from kind of Ada Lovelace day to a Nobel Prize level but you know I mean it's aspirational I sh that's what I should aim for yeah, yeah, I need to create the next set of Nobels. Fantastic. Okay, that's me busy for the next 50 years. Um, okay, so the two books are both available on Amazon. They're both e-books, um, and they're $1.99 each. They're really cheap. Um, and, yeah, if you just search for um, uh, the first, Passion for Science, should find it for you. But there's links on our website. So if you go to findingada.com slash shop, you should find them there. Thank you.